Good afternoon everybody and welcome to uh, Subnetting 101. Uh, I get this question asked uh, a lot in class. Uh, people want to know a little bit more about subnetting, want to understand subnetting a little bit more uh, than, than what we go over. Uh, so I've made a series of videos, uh, about six or seven videos, that we're going to go from the very basics of IP configuration all the way up to uh, determining if your uh, your subnets are valid uh, against the default gateway and may even get into things like variable length subnet masking. But what I decided to do with this string of videos was start at the very beginning. For, for people that, that want to understand uh, IP address schemes uh, and subnetting but don't have a background in it. So we're going to start at the very, very beginning. So what we're going to deal with right off the bat is dealing with the standard IP address information that all this stuff you must know if you ever want to subnet. So this is going to be some generic information that for network administrators out there, these are things that you have memorized a long time ago. You don't have to worry about anymore. Uh, but for, for people that are new to, to IT, uh, they may not know these. And this is stuff that you have to know before you subnet. So we're just going to fly through this stuff rather quickly. Uh, and then in the next video, we're going to get into binary and decimal conversions. Then by the third video, we're going to start subnetting. So these are some things you need to know. First off, we're going to deal with just IPv4. IPv4 addresses, your IP addresses are 32 bits long. They're broken into four groups that we call octets. Each octet is 8 bits in length. It's 8 bits in length. That's going to you're going to understand that completely by the, the second video when we start breaking this thing down into binary. But they're 8 bits each. So it's 8 bits dot 8 bits dot 8 bits dot 8 bits, which equals 32 bits. Every single machine on your network will hold an IP address. If it holds the correct IP address, it can talk to everybody else on the network. These IP addresses cannot be duplicated on any machine inside the same network or you're going to have problems. So every machine is different. If, if you check your home network, your laptops, your tablet, um, your desktops, and if you take a look at the IP addresses, none of those IP addresses will be the same as any other machine. Now, IP addresses can be public or private. They can be static or dynamic. We're not worried too much about static or dynamic right now. Public and private, though, is a big one. And we're gonna, I'm going to break those down in the next slide. Now, they are broken up into five classes, A, B, C, D, and E. But we are only concerned with the first three, A, B, and Cs. So, what are these classes? Well, there's the class A address. These are your biggest class. The starting range technically is 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. And it goes to 127, 255, 255, 255. So if you take a look at that first number, 0 to 127, when you see that, it's a class A address. Class B addresses are between the 128 and the 191 range. So 128, 000, zero, zero to 191, 255, 255, 255. So the 128 to 191, a class B. The class C, 192 to 223. Again, there is a class D and there's a class E, but we are not worried about those. We don't use those. Those are reserved. Okay. So class C, 192, 000 to 223, 255, 255, 255. Okay. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are private IPs and there's also reserved IPs. Private IP addressing allows for network connectivity between machines in your network, but they cannot access the internet without going through something that we call network address translation. And we're going to talk about these private IPs and some reserved ones that we can't use. These ranges, the zero range from 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 255, 255, 255, they're reserved. Your machine should not hold any of these IPs. You can't communicate properly if you hold an IP address range that low. 
Now there is a private range. The first private range we get to is the 10 range. 10.0.0 to 10.255, 255, 255. That is a private range that companies can use in their internal network. They can set up uh, a DHCP server to send out these addresses to machines that, that need IPs and they don't have to worry about purchasing any. But again, they have to run network address translation to turn these private addresses into a public address so those machines can go to the internet. So remember that private range. There is a reserve set in the 127 block that's strictly used for loopback testing. It's for testing network connectivity. No machine should hold a 127 address. The 169.254 address is the one that typically there you have a problem with your network. 169.254.00 to 169.254.255.255. They are they are they are reserved. We do not give those addresses out. Your machine will get that address automatically if there is a problem reaching the DHCP server that's supposed to give it an IP. If it can't get an IP from somewhere, it will give itself its own IP. While you may still be able to talk to some machines on the network if they hold an address in this range, you'll never get out on the internet with it. Okay. Now we have the last two privates, the 172.16 to 172.31. That's a private range. Again, used internally. You can't go out on the internet with it, but if you're running NATing, it'll work. And then the one you mostly see used at home, the 192.168. Uh, not everybody uses that, but most major um, internet providers will set up your network at home to use the 192.168 address. It's a private range, but again, your router is going to be doing your network address translation to give you an address to get you out on the internet. We'll talk about the reasoning for doing all this later on, but it doesn't have anything to really do with subnetting. So you have to remember these private ranges. Now, along with the, the classes, A, B, and C, there are default subnets for every class. They're very easy to remember. For class A, the, the 0 to 127s, the subnet mask is always 255.0.0.0. That's the default subnet mask. And when we get into subnetting, we're going to start changing this, but this is the default one. For class B, the subnet mask is 255.255.0.0. That's the 128 to the 191 range. In the class C, the 192 to the 223 range, their class uh, subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. You have to remember these because these are what we're going to change when we start subnetting. So why even use a subnet mask? Well, IP addresses are broken into two parts, one that we call the network node, one that we call the host node. The subnet mask lets us know which is which. So let me give you an example here. Let me pull a class A address, 69.17.14.3. Well, the default subnet for class A is 255.0.0.0. By knowing this, the network part of that IP address is the 69. That's where the 255 is at. It's in the first octet. The rest of it is the host, the 17.14.3. With a class A address, we can have uh, 16 million plus addresses uh, because all of those numbers, those three octets, all of them can go up to 255. Every machine, just as long as they have a different number, can talk to each other just as long as that 69 is the same. Right. Only machines on the same network can talk to each other. And this becomes a huge problem if you start subnetting and you're not very careful how you do it. You can start having two machines side by side that can't talk to each other because they're on different networks. Okay. Let me give you one more example here. Pull to class C, 221, 70, 12, 123. Well, the default subnet for a class C address is 255, 255, 255, 0. 
So with that being said, the network part is the first three octets. 221, 70, 12. Only the last octet, the, the host part, is the 123. That's where the zero is at. That's the only part that changes per machine. Every machine in your network, if you're using class C, all must start with 221, 70, 12. Can't be any different. The 123, it will be different for every machine. Again, remember, that number can only go to 255. So it'll start with 1 and go up to 255. So I don't have a whole lot of machines. If I have a network of 500 machines, I can't use a class C address. I don't have enough uh, IP addresses to get my machines. Okay. So, once you remember your classes, class A, class B, and class C and their ranges, once you know which ones you can't use, the reserved ones, and you know the default subnet masks for all classes, now you're ready to move on. Now it's time to go from binary to decimal and decimal to binary. You have to be able to do this in order to subnet because you're going to constantly switch from one to the other. All right, very cool. So what we're going to do, we're going to wrap this one up and the next video I'm going to post will show you a very simple way of converting from binary to decimal and decimal to binary. Look forward to seeing you in the next one.